All right, guys, welcome back to Revive School. We've got a brand new week, and man, let me tell you, uh, we're going to be wrapping up uh, in the book of Amos. We are in what's called the Minor Prophets, or as one of our friends from actually the country of Israel, he calls them the Small Prophets. Uh, you know, you have the major prophets and you have the minor prophets. You have to wonder if they ever ha hung out and they're like, gosh, why'd you get that label? You know, <laughs> they had to go to, uh, what's that, counseling? You know, oh, I'm a minor prophet. What's your problem? I've been labeled a minor prophet. Like, it's okay. It's okay. But here's the point is that the major prophets really just have a larger message. When I say larger, when you look at the Bible, you have Isaiah, you have Jeremiah, you have Ezekiel, like literally more chapters in the book. Right? I mean, that's kind of really what it comes down to. The Minor Prophets, just a couple chapters. Some are one, some are a couple. And so we're going to wrap up the book of Amos. Now, Kevin, if you would, would you go to uh, the Kings and Prophets? Some of you are maybe new into the Minor Prophets. Some of you uh, have been tracking with us in Revive School every single day. But here you have this language of uh, the Minor Prophets, specifically Amos. We're going to get into Jonah this week, you guys. We've already covered Hosea. We get into Obadiah. I mean, all of this. Kevin, this is... It's going to be a, a fun week, and it's going to feel like I literally took a bucket of words and I just dumped them on you and be like, hope you can catch it all. <laughs> That's where we're going to be at. But now remember, Amos' message, Kevin, is to who? To the northern tribe. To the northern tribes, which consists of 10 tribes, okay? Then you have, down below, you have the southern kingdom, which is Judah, which also would consist of Jerusalem. I love this chart because you have to have an understanding. Saul, David, and Solomon, okay, just to give another bigger uh, backdrop here, okay, they had a unified kingdom, okay? So they weren't split Israel and Judah. They were 12 tribes. At the end of Solomon's 40-year reign, what happened? Then they split. When they split, Jeroboam the first and then Rehoboam, then they, they became kings into their own kingdoms. These prophets that we hear about, these minor prophets, are the ones speaking into the people because this time frame... 370 plus years, whatever the time frame is, they're not really walking with the Lord. And so you have to have prophets that are going to come in and speak truth into the people because the reality is they're not keeping their eyes on, on Jesus. Yeah, we wouldn't say Jesus. They're not keeping their eyes on God, but you're going to see Christ in every one of these books. And so their goal is to hold them accountable back to the canon, back to the measuring rod, back to the measuring reed, saying, guys, this is what we need. And the problem is, is when prophets release words, whether it's into the northern kingdom like Amos or into the southern kingdom like you might have Isaiah, nobody really likes their words. Because the reality is that these words are harsh and they're like, um, you need to get your act together. You know, whenever I talk to my kids and I say something, I'm saying this for the betterment of them. I'm saying this because I want them to, you know, get in line with something, but they might not receive it right away. And then you know what happens usually over the course of time, they'll be like, they respond to it. Like it always cracks me up when I'll, I'll get a communication from one of my kids like a day later about something that I said that they had been processing. That's really what it is, you guys. These prophets are releasing words. People don't like to hear it, but then with time, there's a process. And in Amos 7, 8, and 9, which is where we're going to go today, you guys, I'll tell you, it's, 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 uh, it's not really a great message again. You're going to see really in 7, 8, and almost all the way into 9, a message of judgment. At the very, very end, we're going to talk about the word that represents Christ, the word that represents uh, here in the book of Amos, which is restore. I'll get into that just so you know that's where we're going to land the plane at the end. Until then, Kevin, it's all judgment. All of it. In fact, when you begin in Amos 7... Let's begin. You're going to see this vision. Okay, now when we say a vision, here's what's happening. The Lord is downloading in front of Amos. Okay, that's what happens. He's not sleeping. Okay, he's, he's awake and the Lord is giving him a visual. You know, for me, this sounds kind of funny, but it's like going into a movie theater. You're sitting down and all of a sudden on the screen, you're watching a movie. That's what's happening to these prophets. God's literally showing them something in the supernatural and yet he's watching it right in front of them. Nobody else is seeing this. But Amos is seeing this. So the first visual in Amos 7, 1, it says, The Lord God showed me this. And here's what he's showing. He's forming a swarm of locusts at the time the spring crop first began to sprout. Now, Kevin, you know, you're involved in, in uh, agricultural world. After you've just heard spring crop uh, coming up and you see a swarm of locusts, what's your first thought? Uh, kind of wasted of our time putting the crop in. Yeah, I can't believe I just put this down. 
So all of a sudden you got a swarm of locusts. They're coming up, spring crops there, cutting of the king's hay, verse 2, and then it says, when the locusts finished eating the vegetation of the land, after everything they had just done, I said, meaning Amos, Lord God, please forgive. How will Jacob survive since he is so small? So right away, Amos knew that the locust served as a judgment from God. He had a visual of these locusts coming in. He saw that Jacob was going to go through this. And so he's, how are we going to survive? And then in verse three, here's what the Lord says. Uh, it will not happen. Relented concerning this. It will not happen. In other words, um, OK, fine. It's not going to happen. Judgment was, was pulled back because of God's tender mercy. Like, that's really what happened. Okay, fine. But then it says there's another vision. Okay, so the first vision, Kevin, that we have, okay, just so we can write it down, in, verse, uh, in chapter 7, in Amos 7, was of locusts, right? Then you have another vision of fire. So in verse 4, it says, the Lord God showed me another vision. Okay, so basically it's an ongoing movie that jumps to the next sitcom, right? Kind of deal or the next segment. Lord God showed me the Lord God was calling for judgment by fire. It consumed the great deep and devoured the land. So judgment is coming through locusts. Nope, God says it's okay. Now through fire. So in verse five and six, you know what's going to happen. Then I said, Amos, Lord God, please stop. How will Jacob survive since he's so small? In other words, okay, if, if Amos saw that it worked the first time, God, don't do this. In verse six, you know what's coming. Then the Lord said, okay, this will not happen either. So the locusts, Kevin, didn't happen. Fire didn't happen. You know what's going to happen now. Uh, go into verse 7 and 8, and this goes to Mindy's painting over here talking about the plumb line, okay? So great visual, Amos 7, 7, he showed me this. So third vision, okay, of a plumb line. The Lord was standing there by a vertical wall with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord asked me, what do you see, Amos? I replied, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, I'm setting a plumb line among my people. I will no longer spare them. Okay, Rich, when you, you, you're really good with your hands. And, and when you hear that God has established a plumb line, what is a plumb line? A uh, plumb line is used in construction. It's used to, uh, typically in masonry, to build, make sure your walls are straight. So if he's saying, I'm making a straight wall, Get among my people, I'll no longer spare them. What's the Lord implying? He's saying that this is my example that I want you to follow. So here's my example. I want you to follow this and I'm done with you because you're clearly not following the example. So what do you know? You know what's going to happen, right? Verse 9, Isaac's house places, Isaac's high, high places will be deserted and Israel's sanctuaries will be in ruins. I will rise up against the house of Jeroboam with a sword. So Kevin, this is what's crazy about this is when you're in uh, Amos 7, like at this point, Kevin, this doesn't imply what? It's uh, not looking good. It's They're going to survive. Good. So the locust didn't happen. Fire didn't happen. According to this, what looks like it's going to happen? Judgment. Judgment. There's no intervention at this point where you normally would expect it to be like, Amos is like, Lord, stop. Okay, no. He's like, no, I'm going to actually, uh, the high places are going to be deserted. Sanctuary is going to be in ruins. I'm going to bring actually a sword, right, against the house of Jeroboam. Now, when we say here at Jeroboam, Kevin, here's Amos's time frame, okay? Here you have Jeroboam's lineage, the second Jeroboam. So we're talking about the house that's in this. By the way, the sword is coming against these guys. And Amos is well aware of what, the Lord's talking about not meeting the standard. Absolutely. You guys are not living. You have to think of a plumb line like the cannon, like the measuring rod, like the reed. Nobody's living up to this standard anymore. That's what he's saying. I think it's really interesting if we use the Word of God as a standard in the church today, would we live up to this standard? Let me just say, you, praise God, Jesus. Um, how do I put this? Sometimes it feels like we'll never live up to the standard, <laughs> but because of Jesus, he, he is our standard. <laughs> because of Jesus, uh, God says, okay, good, you have trust in Christ. I know you're not going to live up to everything, but because of him being your restorer, we're good. But in this context, that's not the case. And so it, says, it continues on in verse 10. I know we're spending a little bit more time here, but Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent word to Jeroboam, king of Israel. So here's, remember this? So now the word, the priest hears about the prophet, okay, right? 
the priest goes to the king, right? That's where we're at here at Jeroboam. The priest goes to the king and says, hey, Amos has conspired against you right here in the house of Israel. The land can't endure all his words. So what's the, what's the, con, con, uh, uh, when he's going against them, what's, what's the priest think? Because of the plumb line, right? Yeah, he's like, the priest is saying, he's brought a conspiracy right. against you and we're not, he's, basically saying we're not going to survive. We're not going to survive this. So he says in verse 11 then, he continues on, for Amos has said this, Jeroboam will die by the sword. Israel will certainly go into exile from its homeland. So word is out. Amos has a vision. The vision is Jeroboam in the house is going to actually die by the sword and go into exile. And the priest says, we don't want this. Remember I talked about the priest releasing words? It's interesting. The priest had already heard it went to the king on behalf. He like ratted on him which is fine because it's, a tr it's true, right? It is true that this is what he heard. So Amaziah said to Amos, go away, you seer, flee to the land of Judah and earn your living and give your prophecies there. I love this. I don't, it's very sarcastic, isn't he? But don't ever prophesy at Bethel again, for it's the king's sanctuary and a royal temple. In other words, how dare you bring in your plumb line word, <laughs> your sword word. <laughs> Just go to your little land and, Talk to yourself and earn a living. Maybe somebody will pay you there. I mean, that's what the priest says. So Amos answered Amaziah, I don't like your name. I'm just kidding. <laughs> he doesn't say that. He says, I wasn't a prophet. I love this line. I was not a prophet or the son of a prophet. Rather, I was a herdsman and I took care of sycamore figs. In other words, I didn't ask for this. I'm taking care of a flock and God just downloads a vision to me. Right? That's what he's saying. He's not like I'm like running for a prophet office. God just gave me this vision. But the Lord took me from the following the flock and said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. In other words, it's this David image, right? Of Psalm 78, David's with the, the flock and God pulls him. He says, now you're going to shepherd my people. That's really what happens. But Amos is going to do it in the form of prophecy. Go prophesy to my people Israel. In other words, I'm not leaving. I'm dropping a word if you don't like it. He continues on. Man, he, he says, in other words, I've been called. That's what he says. I've been called by God. Now hear the word of the Lord in Amos 7, 16. You say, do not prophesy against Israel. Do not preach against the house of Isaac. And then in 17, he says this. Uh, he says, therefore, this is what the Lord says. Oh boy. <laughs> your wife will be a prostitute in the city. Your sons and daughters will fall by the sword and your land will be divided up with a measuring line. There it is. You yourself will die on pagan soil, which Kevin is Assyria. And Israel will certainly go into exile. From its homeland. In other words, by the way, this Assyrian captivity, he's prophesying the city's going to fall apart. Your wife's going to be a prostitute in the city. Your sons and daughters are going to die. Your land is going to be divided up. And oh, by the way, you will go into exile. You're going to die on pagan soil and your people are going to go into exile. Don't you dare tell me to leave. God's given me a word. Take that, Amaziah. I mean, that's what he's saying. I'm a herdsman. And Rich, I love asking your wife the question, what's a herdsman? Well, that's simple. That's one who deals with herds. <laughs> I knew I was going to get that answer. We are so qualified here. Let me just tell you. We are experts in the matter. I, I just, I'm, I'm giving you this visual, you guys, because this plumb line word didn't go away. The locust, nope. Fire, nope. Plumb line, oh, it's going to happen. So when you jump into Amos 8, you have what's called another vision. And it really is, um, this is a basket of summer fruit. That's the visual. And the Lord God showed me this. So he's had a, an argument with Amaziah, right? Now he has another vision. And a basket of, a basket of summer fruit. Okay, it continues on. And the Lord asked me to Amos, what do you see, Amos? And I replied, a basket of summer fruit. The Lord said to me, the end has come for my people Israel. I will no longer spare them. Whoa. I'd be like, that doesn't, <laughs> what's that have to do with fruit? <laughs> you know, right, Kevin? Uh, if I uh, didn't like the words before, the words here are not very good either. Man, it's, it's crazy. In fact, three through, really three through nine, uh, you know, you have this image of, let me just read three. You know, the end has, uh, uh, yeah, verse, can you go back to two then for me? It's probably at the end of two. Uh, the end has come, I want to say that again, sorry, thanks. The end has come for my people, I'll no longer spare them. Then he continues on in verse three. Uh, in that day, the temple songs will become wailing. This is the Lord's God declaration. Many dead bodies thrown everywhere, silence. 
I'm pretty sure nobody's going to like this word. It continues on, and you see this in 4. Listen, you guys need to listen up to this, right? This is what he begins to talk through. I want you to jump, Kevin, if you can, to uh, verse 10 because of time. Uh, in verse 10, it says this, I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I'll cause everyone to wear sackcloth, every head to be shaved. I'll make that grief like mourning for an only son and its outcome like a bitter day. In other words, you're going to see that there is, J. Vernon McGee says, a dark day is coming. That's Amos's words. And then in verse 11, here it comes. Here it is. Hear this. The days are coming. This is the declaration of the Lord God. When I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of bread or thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Poof. In other words, the people of Israel don't want to hear truth. You're not going to find it. You're not going to hear it. There's going to be a famine of this. And this plumb line, people don't, they don't want anything to do with it. God's going to withdraw. Uh, there's no other way to put this. He's going to pull back his word from them. And it says in verse 12, look at this. Because of people wandering away from the word, they become wandering Jews. People will stagger from sea to sea, roam from north to east, seeking the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. This is one of the most unique pictures of a Jewish person today. Uh, it's, it's kind of interesting. When they pull away from the word, now if it's not just for Jews, if you apply it to Gentiles, which it's not, but if you were to apply it to Gentiles, just isn't that the truth? We pull away and it's like you're seeking everything but the word. That's really what it comes down to. They're not going to find it. And so in, in verse 12, I'm, with, I'm going to pull myself away from the whole scenario. This is Amos' vision of a summer fruit. I do have a question, though, because it really bothers me. Why the image of a summer fruit, you guys? I don't know. Maybe for something, maybe the summer fruits were more pleasing to the people. And in that case, it's they're more pleasing to the Lord because the, the basket of fruit is really a, a, an analogy of the, Jew, the Jewish people. I don't know. That's my guess. It's good. All right. So either way, either way, the basket of summer fruit, it's there's at some point uh, there's going to be it's an image of there's going to be a famine like it was here and now it's going to be gone. Right. I think that's a fair statement. So that's your visions. You have the locusts, you have the fire, you have the plumb line, you have the summer fruit that eventually there will be nothing, no, no fruit, so to speak. And then I want to get into nine today, which is where I thought we were going to spend a lot more time, but uh, we got some time left here. But in Amos 9, you have a, an interesting vision of what we would call an altar. Now, typically, when you see in verse, verse 1, okay, I'm just going to hit a pause. I saw the Lord standing beside the altar. If I am an Israelite, okay, north or south, if I'm a prophet and I'm like, okay, look, I'm the Lord's standing beside the altar. Kevin, all we basically have heard is judgment up until this point, seven and eight. And now I'm like, oh, good. The Lord's at the altar. Like, this is going to be good. Make a sacrifice. Yeah, something positive. It actually gets, it gets worse. <laughs> like, literally... Uh, this next vision, I was like, wow, God, that's not what I was expecting. The next 10 verses, you actually see destruction and dispersion. So I saw, remember Amos, I saw the Lord standing beside the altar. And he said, strike the capitals of the pillars so that the thresholds shake. Knock them down on the heads of all the people. Then I will kill the rest of them with the sword. So by the way, this, this is not any restoration. <laughs> None of those who flee will get away. None of their uh, fugitives will escape. In other words, the temple is going to be torn down. Like this is the picture that they're literally, and in this, I mean, I mean this is crazy. So you have a shaking going on. And then in verse two, if, uh, if they dig down to Sheol, from there, my hand will take them. If they climb up to heaven, from there, I will bring them down. In other words, Kevin, there's a destruction coming to the temple, a destruction coming to the people, and they're trying to escape, right? That's, they're trying to escape from this. So if they're going to dig down even into hell, God says, I'll find them. If they go up into heaven on a ladder and climbing up, God says, don't worry, I'll find them there. I love this. Judgment cannot escape whether you go to heaven or to hell. 
truly nobody's escaped from God's judgment. It's a really incredible picture of Amos 9 2, in my opinion, because it's kind of like this thought of, I'm going to go here, I'm fine. I'm going to go here, I'm fine. No, no, no. Nobody is fine when it comes to God's judgment. Like they're going to dig their way down. <laughs> or like there's a Werner ladder that could climb you to heaven. <laughs> I don't know. I've worked at my parents' Ace hardware, so everything was a Werner ladder. Basically, uh, <laughs> MacArthur says they were just desperate to escape. Here's what's interesting. In verse 3, it continues on about this mindset. If they hide themselves on the top of Carmel, from there I'll track them down and seize them. If they conceal themselves from my sight on the seafloor, from there I will command, it continues on, the sea serpent to bite them. <laughs> In other words, at the highest point on earth, so we were talking about the universe, quote unquote, earlier. Now at the highest point of the earth, Carmel, or on the seafloor, by the way, I'll find them. My point is, you know, in Romans 8, 38, 39, Romans 8, 38, and 39, we talk about how the love of God, nothing can separate us from the love of God, right? We, we've heard this language. For I'm persuaded that neither death or life, angels or rulers, things present, things to come, or hostile powers, uh, hostile, not Austin powers, height or depth or any other created thing will have the power to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus the Lord. So I love this image that nothing can separate us from the love. Wherever we're at, the love of God. I want you to have that same implication, though, with the wrath of God. Nothing can separate us in the sense of the wrath of God will follow us unless through Christ Jesus, then we're fine. But my point is, back then, you guys, they are constantly trying to what? Run and flee. That's why it says then in verse 4, if they're driven by their enemies into captivity, from there I will command the sword to kill them. So even when they go into captivity, I'm still going to kill them. I will fix my eyes on them for harm and not for good. This is God's people that he's talking about, by the way. All because they were not looking to him. Kevin, this whole time period up here, constantly they had opportunities to turn to the Lord. And what did they do? They went to the false idols. They went to the false worships. They're not measuring up to the standard, basically. There's, they don't even know what standard is. Verse 5 of Amos 9, the Lord, he's not done, by the way. The God of hosts, he touches the earth. It melts and all who dwell in it mourn. All of it rises like the Nile. We're talking about the Nile River and subsides like the Nile of Egypt. He builds his upper chambers in the heavens and lays the foundation of his vault on the earth. He summons the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. Yahweh is his Name. It continues on in verse 7. Israelites, are you not like the Cushites, you know, Ethiopia to me? This is the Lord's declaration. Did I bring Israel from the land of Egypt, the Philistines from Kaphtor, and the Arameans from Kerr? Look, the eyes of the Lord God are on the sinful kingdom. Whew. Israel is what he's talking about right here. The eyes of the Lord are on the sinful kingdom. He's talking about Israel. You know, we always think about this royal treasure or we talk about this is my prized possession. Like he loves his people. He just called them the sinful kingdom and I'm going to destroy it from the face of the earth. However, now here's the, <laughs> this is what drives me crazy. I'm going to destroy it from the face of the earth. However, I will not totally destroy the house of Jacob. Well, which one is it? Right? I mean, that's kind of my mindset when you read this. But you have to have an understanding. It, it, it's like the Noah mindset. I'm going to wipe off the face of the earth, but I'm going to spare Noah and his wife and his kids. Right? That's kind of the mentality. It's the same mentality. I'm so tired of this sinful kingdom. I'm going to literally destroy it. But however, not all of it. The house of Jacob. This is the Lord's declaration. It continues on. From about to command, give the command, and I will shake the house of Israel among all of the nations. As one shakes a sieve, but not a pebble will fall to the ground. And then here it is, you guys. In 10, he says, all the sinners among my people who say disaster will never overtake or confront us will die by the sword. You know what that really is implying? It's like this, th th these false messages out there, right? We're good. We're good. We're fine. There's no judgment coming to the churches. I mean, this is in context to Israel. There's no judgment coming on us. Don't worry. All of those who say that, you will die by the sword. And oh, by the way, Amaziah, the priest, remember that? You're going to die on another land. Your wife's going to be a prostitute. Your kids are going to die by the sword and everybody else is going to be dying. So like he just reiterates what he's been saying. And then finally, praise God, though, in 11 through 15, we've got some hope. 
Why? Because the shaking is going to occur and there's going to be a little remnant that still believes that God is good. <laughs> In that day, I will restore the fallen booth of David. David. I will repair its gaps, restore its ruins, and rebuild it as in the days of old. Continues on in 12, so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that are called by my name. This is the Lord's declaration. He will do this. Verse 13, hear this, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration. Now, this is a cool picture. When the plowman will overtake the reaper and the one who treads grapes and the sower of seed. In other words, this is kind of a cool, it's a picture of prosperity is what this is. A picture of prosperity, literally where planting and reaping are going to overlap because it's so much of an abundance. And in fact, the mountains will drip with sweet wine and the hills will flow with it. Verse 14, it says, I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel. They will rebuild and occupy ruined cities, plant vineyards and drink their wine, make gardens and eat their produce. And here it is in 15. It's like this ultimate. And just so you know, 11 through 15 should be about six messages. This is all about the regathering and the restoration of the kingdom of God in Israel. Like you guys, this is a picture of the millennial kingdom. That's what this is. Yes, in their mind, they don't even know about the Assyrian captivity, <laughs> right? But Kevin, this is that picture of here it is. You're going into captivity and in their mind, they get out of captivity and oh yeah, things are going to be restored. That's the mindset. But man, it's a way bigger picture than that. It's after Christ comes back for his people, right? This is the image that we have after the, the um, okay, so let's think about it this way. Christ comes back the first time, okay? They say no. The Gentiles say, hey, yes, this is our Messiah. He comes back a second time after the seven years of tribulation. OK, after all hell's broken out. Really, that's what it looks like. Christ comes back and then implements a thousand year reign. This is what we're talking about. He says, I will plant them on their land and they will never again be uprooted from the land I've given them. Yahweh, your God has spoken. Final words, you guys, of, of a prophetic word. And I think it's so crazy. It went from judgment to what? Restoration. Restoration comes in the book of Amos when Christ comes back and the Israelis turn to the Messiah and he plants them on their land. And they never have to worry about losing their land again. They never have to worry about being uprooted and going into an Assyrian or a Babylonian captivity. No, not, no more. Christ says, I am the ultimate restore. All of that through locusts, fire, plumb lines, baskets of summer fruit, a vision of the altar. <laughs> None of it looks good, but yet in all of this, God's doing a cleansing in his people so that in his people, they'll trust him. Isn't that what we need to do? We we'll probably need to go through a cleansing based on the word of God to keep our eyes on him. And when we do, he promises to restore us. It's the book of uh, Amos, one of the minor prophets. Uh, we're going to keep doing this tomorrow. We're going to talk through the book of Obadiah. I hope you'll join us. Thanks. <laughs>